Wow, thank you. My name is Jim Kutso, and I'm the proud father of Kevin Kutso and William Kutso. Kevin was a 17-year-old junior at Ward, and he took his life on February 4th, 2021. When I think of John Troutwine, I think of hope and inspiration. When Kevin passed, many people in the Fairfield community asked me if I had heard of John, and I hadn't. I looked him up and the Will to Live organization, and he provided hope to me. I saw a man whose own son passed away over 13 years ago. I saw a man who was still living and still had his family intact through the worst possible moment in a parent's life. It gave me hope that my family could survive. John inspired me by honoring the memory of his son while creating awareness of mental health and breaking the, stig the stigma that is associated with it. Kevin did not know what he wanted to do, but he knew he wanted to help people. He learned that on the Appalachian Service Project. John inspired me to create Kevin's Afterglow. Through that, we are honoring Kevin's desire to help people. We are helping fight the pediatric mental health crisis. We plan to place buddy benches in all of Fairfield Public Schools by the end of the school year. And we plan on giving a scholarship to a well-deserving student who is planning on becoming a pediatric mental health care provider. I consider John a mentor and use many of his concepts when I speak before audiences just like you. John has touched many lives and has helped me touch many more. He inspired me to make a difference. It is my hope that John inspires you today. I hope it inspires you to do something kind. Be the change you want to be and you can make a difference in someone's life. It is my honor to introduce John Troutline. Thank you very much, Jim. Do I need to raise this? Can you guys hear me okay? So it's my honor to be here. It's my honor to to get to see my, my friend Jim again. And um, he's inspiring me. I hope that the messages that you receive today inspire you to do. What I'm gonna try to do today is not tell you what not to do. I'm gonna challenge you to do some things. I'm gonna challenge you to approach Thanksgiving and approach the rest of this school year, approach the holidays, approach next year, approach the challenges that you face over these next couple years. I know I'm talking to the juniors and seniors. I want you to approach them in a different way. I want you to approach them in a way that inspires you and inspires those around you. That's the goal today. I was here about a year ago so many of you heard this presentation. I have tried to mix it up just a little bit, but then again, sometimes things we need to hear often. Sometimes we need to hear them again and again. You know why, guys? Because life gets in the way. It has a strange way of just interrupting and getting in the way and prohibiting, you, prohibiting us from doing these things that we want to do. So I'm going to quickly take you through, through our story, once again introducing you to my family, my lovely wife Susie, our four children, 
Will and Tommy and Michael and Holland. We live in Johns Creek, Georgia. That's a suburb of Atlanta. Been there since 1997. I am the chief customer officer of an IT services company. I've been in sales and marketing. I've been a sales and marketing executive for 30 years. I grew up in Barrington, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. I went to Northwestern University where I played baseball there. And um, came from an athletic family. Both my father and my brother were professional baseball players. I signed with the Montreal Expos after I graduated from college. That shows you how old I am. The Expos don't exist anymore. But I did spend seven years traveling all around America in the minor leagues, and I spent one of those years right here in this area playing for the Red Sox in Boston. If you Google me, guys, you'll be disappointed I wasn't that good. But I had a lot of teammates. I had a ton of them. My wife is the real athlete in the family. She was a two-sport athlete at the University of Virginia where she played lacrosse and field hockey. She, too, has a ton of teammates in her life. And I guess we never realized the power our teammates had to inspire us, to positively motivate us, to change our approach to life. And the story that I'm going to take you guys on is an example of that, is the example of the power that we do have, no matter what age we are, to deliver hope to each other and make the day a little bit better. And really, that's my goal here, is to make the day a little bit better and to give you guys some tools and some ammunition to make each of your days a little bit better. And I challenge you all to think about the relationships in your life because it is my opinion that God's greatest gift to me is the relationships in my life and the power these relationships have to make our days a little bit better. Happy, healthy, successful family. I always say this, loving home. My wife is nuts about me. I'm nuts about her. People in our neighborhood would tell you that the trout wines were living the dream until October 15th, 2010, when it ended. Our oldest son, Will, who was a freshman in high school at the time, took his life. As you can see, big, strong, healthy, talented, happy, successful, had an army of friends, and it was so much fun to see Will with his friends. He was even known as the leader of his friends. And maybe his best trait was that he truly rejoiced in the success of his friends. And what was interesting about Will, and I want you guys to really think about this, is the, what he, how he defined his friends. I was his friend. His brothers and sister were his friends. His mother, his grandparents were his friends. It wasn't just his teammates. He had a unique ability to understand that teammates are everywhere in our life. And when we lost him, his teammates were really devastated. And I remember thinking, what can I do? What can I do to get this dream back, to carry Will's light? Just like Jim's carrying Kevin's light, to put it in a positive way, to inspire you guys to do things that improve your lives and improve your day. And I remember that week when Will died People came out of the woodwork talking to me about mental illness in their lives. It's everywhere, guys. It's everywhere. Depression is everywhere. I didn't know that. I was uneducated about it. I was unaware of it. And as a result of it, I was a parent that was blind to it. 
I didn't know that one in five of you suffer from it. I didn't know that one in five of the people in my life suffer from it. I, don't, I didn't know that my employees, one in five of them, have it. I thought it was a character flaw. I thought it was a choice. I thought it was something I could talk people out of because I'm a good speaker. I'm a good salesman. I didn't know it was maskable. I didn't know it could be easily hidden. I didn't know it was a physical issue. I wish I did know that. I didn't know that one in five suffer from it. I didn't know that every two hours in America a teenager loses the will to live. I didn't know any of that. Had I known, maybe I would have done some things just a little bit differently. Had Will's friends known that, maybe they would have done something differently. Had Will known that, had Will known that he was really very normal because one in five is a lot. It's common. It's treatable and it's beatable. It's okay. But he lived in a time and he lived in a culture where it was not okay to not be okay. And I regret that. And I decided I'm just going to find a way to create a culture where it is okay to not be okay and get people to talk, get people to express. Because when you do express, you do feel better. So I remember thinking, what am I going to do to get people to talk? And at Will's funeral, I started to see all of his friends. I started to notice all his friends on the left side of the church in their lacrosse jerseys from Northview High School in, in the Atlanta area. And as I was talking about Will and how he just loved being on the team and how he just loved being with you guys, he didn't care if he won, he didn't care if he scored the goal, he wanted to be on this team with you. He wanted to, he loved you and he'd want you guys to love each other. And as I'm saying this, I'm starting to pick out my teammates. There was Randy Karen. He was in, in band with me when I was in seventh grade. I played the trumpet. And Jimmy Bartels was the first baseman on my little league team. And Mark Savard and I played middle school basketball together. A bunch of guys from my high school football team was there. A bunch of guys from, from my, my high school friends were there that were not official teammates. They were friend teammates. And Susie saw the same. People from all walks of our lives had come to be there for me in my time of need. They knew me. They understood me. They were in the trenches with me. They sat next to me in auditoriums like this and had to listen to people like me talk. They had the psycho teachers and crazy principals and, and weird old coaches and long bus rides and unfair things, right? We did it all together. They understood me. And I remember thinking, these life friends, these life teammates, these guys that I asked to be in my wedding, these guys that, that were godfathers to my kids were, the, were life's best friends. And I realized while I was giving the, the eulogy to Will that I met these guys when I was your age. You all have life teammates. You all have some of the greatest life teammates already in your life. Oh, if Will would have just known that, and if he and his friends realized that we're all struggling and it is okay, maybe he would have said, man, what the heck is up with me? And had he known that it's okay and that it's everywhere and that there's wonderful organizations that can help, maybe he would have talked about it. It's an illness, and an illness needs treatment. And in order, to have it, in order to get the treatment, you have to talk about it. So I created this Will to Live Foundation to do just that, to work with kids. And it was going to be for the kids and through the kids and by the kids. And you guys were going to do wonderful things, like raise money by selling hoodies and then donate that money to foundations like Kevin's Afterglow and the Will to Live Foundation. And that gets, that gets put right back in this community to educate the adults in your life about mental illness and the struggles that we go through. And this foundation took off, and, and the kids loved it because they related to it. They, they needed to hear it. 
And I remember spending so much time with these kids, I started to learn things I never learned before. This is really important for all of you guys. You are not listening to a doctor. You are not listening to a psychiatrist or, or a, 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 a psychologist or a medical professional in any way. You are listening to a dad who loved his son and loves his other kids so much and is clueless, just like your dad, just like your mom. We don't know. There are no classes to be parents. We don't know. We just love you. And we want you to be okay. That's how I was, but I was uneducated and I was unaware. And as I started to spend time with these kids and really started to listen and try to understand the day in the life of a Fairfield High teenager in the year 2022, I realized that. It is a different world. I realized that I was looking at my son's life through my eyes. I didn't have this auditorium. I didn't have these fields, these stadiums. I didn't have travel teams where you'd go to Charlotte to play in a lacrosse tournament when you're 11. I didn't have that. I didn't have all these gadgets. I didn't have all of these opportunities at young ages that, that you all have and that Will had. So I was seeing awesomeness. Isn't this great? Isn't this awesome? Isn't this wonderful? Not once did I ever say to Will, wow, this is hard. This sucks. I didn't have to do that. You guys have it harder than I did. I told you this last year. I'm telling it to you again. What you are doing is hard, and I'm so impressed by how you're navigating through it. And I want you guys to be impressed with yourself because this is unlike any other time in history, what you guys are having to face. And when I talk to parents, and I just talked to parents last Sunday back in Atlanta, and I saw a couple dads like going, oh, wait a minute. You're really going to tell me my son had it harder than I did? And I walked uphill in the snow with no shoes and both ways. And he, had a, he has a car. I got my first car when I was 22. And he gave me all these stories. And I started to roll my eyes, and I'm like, Dad, I win. You didn't have that, did you? And he says, no. What comes with this, what comes with social media, what comes with the Internet of Things is unlike anything the adults in your life had to deal with. You don't hear this very often. That's why I'm so glad you're here, because I want you to hear it. This is really hard what you're doing. But who best understands how hard it is that you're doing? It's not me. I'm trying. And I know more than I used to. And it's not your teachers. And it's not your parents. It's your peers. It's the people sitting next to you. Whether they're friends or not, they get you. They're facing these same obstacles. And I challenge all of you to understand that these obstacles are hard and one in five of you is struggling. Be that type of friend that helps create this culture where you understand that this is hard. And if I can get you guys to do that, that becomes easier to talk and your relationships improve. And that's what this was all about. And I wish one time I would have just said to Will, isn't this hard as he was facing these obstacles? Where are you gonna go to college? Number one source of stress and anxiety in America for teenagers. Where are you going to go? Guess what? I'm here to tell you all, there are not enough spaces. The school, your dream school, doesn't have enough spaces for all of you. And you might get that rejection letter. It's OK. I beg of you to really listen to this. It's OK, because it's not the school, guys. It's you. I interview people every year. Not one time did I ask what they got in English their sophomore year at Fairfield Ward. Not one time have I asked them what they got on the SAT or ACT. Not one time have I ever asked, nor has anybody ever asked me what my grade point average was. 
I've been an executive for 30 years. No one has ever asked me that. Thank God. They're all good schools, guys. It's you. Every boss that I ever had did not go to a school with the academic credentials of Northwestern University. Their schools were not as good as my school, but they're my boss because it's not the school. It's the individual. When you guys go to the interview, yep, you might have a paper that says where that degree is from. You might not even have a degree. What they're going to say, they're going to look at you, they're going to interview you, they're going to ask you crazy questions, they're going to check your eye contact. How did you ask when you, when you uh, got, got asked a crazy question? What's your, what's your body language like? How did you shake my hand? Did you look me in the eye when you talk? What's your sense of ownership? How good of a team player are you? Because if you're not a good team player, you're going to struggle. And I hope, guys, when you do write your college essays and you do have interviews and they ask you what you like most about yourself, you say, I love being on a team. I am a great team player and I love that about me. That means relationships. That means you honor relationships. You respect them and you maximize them. And that's what I'm trying to get you guys to do here. It's the relationships that can really drive your happiness and can really drive you because no matter what school you go to, you can enjoy it and you can be successful with it. And I think of these other things and I think of the athletic side of things and you heard me say I, I pitched for the Red Sox. I wouldn't make your high school baseball team this year. I just wouldn't. Because when I was 10, I was a dork, and I wouldn't have made the travel team, so I would have had to pick a new sport. But back in 1972, there were no travel teams, and the world was patient, and I got to grow, and I got to, got to, uh, to, to, to continue playing my dream. It's different now, and I never thought of that. And then when I think of the social aspect of everything, when I think of this, and I think what happens when we make mistakes today, I always tell the story when I was 15, my girlfriend, two days before homecoming, after I had just bought a suit, dumped me. And she so regrets that. <laughs> but guess what? Nobody tweeted it. It wasn't on Snapchat or Instagram. My Facebook relationship didn't change. When I talk to the parents, when I talk to the teachers, these kids, teachers, they wake up today knowing that if they fumble, if they make a mistake, everybody they have ever known has the potential to know about it by lunch. That's a whole different world than the adults in your life went through. And it's hard. But understand you have people sitting next to you that really do get you and really do understand that. This year, on February 4th, the anniversary, this year on February 4th just so happens to be the 13th running of the Where There's a Will, There's a Way 5K. So we'll be dedicating that to Kevin. It's our biggest event. Last year we raised $225,000 on that event run by high school kids. Think of the power you all have. Every year we have long sleeve t-shirts and they're beautiful and they're fun and there's great logos on it and things like that. Well, last year's, the t-shirt just said, the will to live. And on the back, it had a semicolon. That was it. No sponsors, nothing, semicolon. That shirt was talked about more on social media and for the next weeks. What is this semicolon all about? Sometimes we don't need to end the sentence. Sometimes we just want to pause and then continue. The semi semicolon project is based on that. Sometimes we just need to pause during a bad day and we breathe, and then we continue. I challenge all of you to remember that when you see a friend in need. That's what a life teammate does. Help them pause. 
help them breathe, help them continue. It's very, very powerful. You know, I've been talking about life teammates, and I've been talking about life teammates for, this is my 13th year of doing it. And I realize that there are people right here in this room that feel that they don't have life teammates, or they used to have life teammates. Maybe they just moved here. Maybe they're just alone. Maybe they've been bullied, whether it be by life, society, or classmates. Do you know of people who are on a team of one? You do. You also know people that are teammates of yours that believe they are on a team of one. That was Will, one of the more popular kids in his class, leader of his lacrosse team, was on a team of one in his mind. He never expressed that. He never talked that. He didn't live in a time where the culture was, I want to talk about it. There are people in your lives that believe they're on a team of one that might not realize the life teammates that they have. Remember I talked about how Will had this great understanding of what a teammate was. <clears throat> it can be your dad. It can be your mom. The teammate sitting next to you that's a peer is the one that understands you the most. There are people here that feel like they're not understood and I challenge you guys to be that type of friend that's on the lookout for that. Because if you are that, you will feel better. The power of helping, the power of giving should never be underestimated. And that's really what the foundation is trying to push because there are lonely people in a crowd. So be that sort of friend that's looking for them. Because guess what? It's very, very common. If you do feel like you're on a team of one, know that you're one of millions and not one in a million. And there are teammates in your life. And sometimes the best way to understand that or to deal with that <coughs> is to express. When the pandemic hit, I couldn't do this. This is my passion. This is something that I'm good at. This is something that I love to do. This is my therapy. This helps me. And for a year, I couldn't do it. And I was, I was, I was getting into a funk. I was, getting, I was, letting, I was letting the depression set, sit, sit in. So I decided I was going to have a social media thing, and for 100 straight days, I was going to make one of these, one of these memes. 100 straight days, I expressed what was on my mind about the importance of being there for each other and being a life teammate. And during those 100 days, I started to feel better. I was expressing myself, and it helped me get through a tough time. And when the 100 days were over, I missed it, but I understood now the challenge I had. If we can express what we're feeling, if we can create a culture where our friends express, it is huge in our healing. It is a key part of those of you who do feel you're on a team of one. Write a letter, write a song, play the piano, draw something, write something, create a blog, any of these things that help you express will help you get through a difficult time. What is your passion? What do you love to do? And can you do it more often? <clears throat> you guys are gonna see people who are struggling. I'm challenging you guys to create a culture where people talk about it. And when you have a friend in need, you act. You acknowledge that you live in that same difficult, very hard world that we just talked about. You care, you show them the love, you show them the hope, you show them the positive that they are not able to see right now. And you talk about it and you tell an adult and do it together. We're so much stronger when we're together. None of us is as strong as all of us. We, you've heard all the cliches, but a life teammate creates this culture where you can do this together. You show that understanding. The good is always there. 
Now, you guys might remember this from last year. There's two videos that are going to play simultaneously this time. It was from 1988. <clears throat> it's an example of the power a teammate has. The video on the left, you're going to see in a minute, is me pitching for the Red Sox. And on that night in April of 1988, I gave up the longest home run in the history of Fenway Park. It sucked. It was brutal. It was not a fun day. It went over the green monster. It went over the screen. It went over the street. It went over the bars. It landed on the mass turnpike. It was the ESPN play of the game. It was brutal. The one on the right is the same night, me getting my first major league strikeout. I kept the sound. Try to see if you can pick this out. The better you can work the ball into the strike zone or catch it into the strike zone, the ball you away from it, obviously. Which one do you think I remembered? It was the home run. That night sucked. That night was awful. That night was brutal. There was nothing good about that night. That was, it consumed me. I came into that game for Roger Clemens, who also gave up seven runs that night. I came in with the bases loaded and got an out to end the inning, saved his three runs. I struck out two guys that night. I was pitching in the major leagues that night. But all I could think of was the moonshot that Mark McGuire hit that landed on the Massachusetts Turnpike. All I could think of was the negative in my life. And the next day, I go to lunch with my high school best friend, his big brother, and he, he explains to me what that night meant to him. He said, all I know, John, is I saw my little brother's best friend in a Red Sox uniform in Fenway Park get his first major league strikeout. I saw you, John, achieve an absolute lifelong dream, and all you're doing here is talking about giving up a home run to a guy who hits home runs off of everybody. I was so happy for you, John. I was so happy that you got to achieve something so important. And I said to him, I did? I was so obsessed with the negative. I was so obsessed with what was going wrong in my life that I missed the little things. I missed the sunset. I missed the smile. I missed the positives that do exist. And sometimes you need a friend to show you that. And then you also need a friend to remind you of what got you there, of what are your unique abilities, what are your positives. The home run on the left to Mark McGuire was a pitch right down the middle, belt high. <coughs> Merry Christmas, Mark. Enjoy. He did. My pitching coach said, Trout Wine, don't throw the ball down the middle to Mark McGuire. He told me exactly what not to do. Pitch on the right is the strikeout. It's low and away. It's tough to, it's tough to hit. The ball's moving. My teammate, Wes Gardner, said, what was that pitch you struck out Javier on? I said to Sinker, he goes, dude, that's your pitch. You need to throw that more often. That was awesome. He told me what I should do. It's a big difference there. Those teachers and coaches that tell you only what you shouldn't do are not the ones you're going to come back and visit when you're in college. Those teachers that coaches that also tell you what you should do and rejoice in those things that you do well. Those are the ones that you remember. Learning from your mistakes, yep, you got to do it. But what is it that you do well and can you do it more often? What is it that you do well and what is it that you love to do? What's your major going to be? What's your summer job going to be? Think this through. And if you guys don't understand what it is that you do well, ask your friends and really listen to their answer because they will help you. I learned that night. I didn't learn from the home run. I learned from the strikeout. I started doing things differently. 
Very, very interesting approach to this, and I think that's what's so important. It also made me recognize the little positives that did exist in my life. Three A's and a B and a C is a really good student. Yep. Let's try to figure out what's happening in the class. I'm getting A's. That is not happening when I get a C. And when I talk to you parents <coughs> and teachers, I look at that coach on the right. What's he saying? I think he's saying, hey, nice job. I'm really proud of you. By the way, you look good. Let's go to dinner tonight. That face was given to me thousands of times by my coaches. But the ones, those coaches that get Christmas cards from me, they gave me that face, not only when I messed up, but also when I did something well. They were motivated, they were pumped by it. Trout wine, great job! And I could see that they cared about me. I could see that they enjoyed, they were rejoicing in my success. <coughs> and those were the guys that I would run through the wall for. Those were the teachers that I came back to see over Thanksgiving when I was in college. Positive passion. What is it that I love to do? Can I do it more often? Talk to your friend today. Ask him what he thinks your positive passion should be. You know, when I think of what we're trying to do here today, it's, it's in a lot of ways, it is a reaction. I'm up here doing something as a result of a tragedy in my life. Jim and his family are doing the same. And someone said to me, 1090, Trout, 1090. 10% of life is what happens to you. 90% is what you choose to do with it, what you choose to make of it, how you choose to react to it. I challenge you guys, remember it does say 1090. It's not 199. Give yourself that 10. It's okay to not be okay. And I think that was so helpful to me. What Jim did today was hard for him. I spoke to my son's high school last week. It was hard. But I knew it was something good, and I knew it was something that Will would want me to do. Will would want me to be up here telling you guys to love each other and be there for each other. Just like Kevin, who's probably sitting next to Will right now saying, check out our dads. And I think that's just so important. I'm trying to improve your day. Simple as that. And you have the ability to do it, and you have the ability to help each other. And when I, when I talk to your parents, I try to ask, how are you, how are you communicating? And I said, I said, you know, because I do this all the time, I said to parents, don't ask them how their day was. They were in school, their day sucked. Ask them something else. Ask them what pissed them off today. Ask them who motivated you today. Ask them, do you have any friends in need? Do you, have, do you know anybody who's on a team of one? Why don't we get your guys together and see if we can't do something for, for, for uh, Kevin's afterglow? Have those kind of conversations. That's much more fun than, how'd you do on the test? What did the coach say? What kind of homework you got? Real conversations. Ask your parents about their, their wedding party. Ask your parents about their bridesmaids and their groomsmen and how old they were when they met them and why. And do they keep in touch with them today? Because I'm sure they'd love to hear, them, hear from them. I am here because two of my best buddies from 30 years ago, 35 years ago, brought me here, that live here in this town. The power of teammates should never be underestimated. I'm trying hard to understand you guys. And I think I've made great progress with it. I don't think my son Will ever said that dad gets me. I think he said dad loves me. I think he said dad's a good guy. I don't think he said dad understands me, because I didn't. I like to think that his brothers Tommy and Michael and his sister Holland do say that I have a clue now. Help your parents get a clue. Help your relationship with your parents by giving them that clue. Life is hard, man. And sometimes you need your friends to help you get through it. Remember, nobody loves you like your parents. Nobody understands you 
like your pals. The relationships in your life, that's, that's the, the whole key here. Who are those people in your life that you want to make sure you're on their list if they are struggling? Who are those people in your life that you want to make sure they call you when something great does happen? I challenge you all to leave today with a, with a goal of making sure that this holiday season your friends know that you love them. Because guess what? They're struggling. One in five of your friends is struggling. And it's okay. Because it's a mess out there. I am just turned 60. I've just become an empty nester. I'm a mess. I look in the mirror and I, I'm expecting to see a 40-year-old and I'm seeing a 60-year-old. I'm a mess. Who best understands that? My 23-year-old son? Absolutely not. My other buddy who's about to turn 60 and soon becoming an empty nester, he gets it and we can talk about it. Take advantage of these relationships that you have and these teammates that you do have in your life. It's just so important. If I can get you all to say I love you, I can get, I can get you guys to create this culture where it is easier to talk about it. So as I do every year, we're going to end this, end this show today by me asking all of you that in honor of the friends and teammates and loved ones in your life today, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I love you, man. Let's see it. <laughs> Love you, man. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> stop, 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 stop. You. It happens. All right, guys, guys. It happens every time. Every single time I ask you guys to do this, this happens. All I said was turn to the person next to you and say, love you, man. You guys are hugging each other. Everybody's getting excited. This whole room just lit up for, for two minutes. That's the power of it. Do that a few times a day, guys, because you're not doing it now. I'm pretty sure of it. Life is getting in the way of these little things. Do not let it. Do not let life get in the way of your friends from doing things like this. When you do this, guys, you're giving. And when you're giving, you feel better. And these problems in your life dissipate just a little bit and your day gets a little bit better. And I challenge you guys to remember that as you go forward, because this is tough what you're doing, but together it can be great. And that's the message of will to live, and that's the message of life teammates, that's the message of Kevin's afterglow, and that's the message of, of this school. And I so applaud the Fairfield community for bringing me back every year to reiterate this message so that life doesn't get in the way of being that great teammate. So thank you all very, very much. I wish you just a wonderful Thanksgiving. Drop a love you man at the, at the Thanksgiving table tonight. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and